can have a seat. Thank you for the warm welcome. My name is Brandy Wilson, as Connie said, and Connie's a dear friend of mine. Pastor Connie has the gift of encouragement and prayer, and I never hang up the phone with her um, without her praying over me the most beautiful, life-empowering prayer. And it's just so nice to have friends like that in your life. You guys have a really incredible um, pastor family leading your church. Super honored to be here with you as one of the unique voices they put on their stage here at Freedom Church. Um, I, my name is Brandy Wilson. I am a single mom from right outside of Nashville, Tennessee in a town called Franklin, which I like to call modern Mayberry because in ways it feels like we're going back in time. But if you are a single parent, I'm gonna draw attention to you right now, and it's for, it's for a good purpose. If you're a single mom or a single dad, I'd love for you to stand up just so we can recognize you. Lots of times single parents don't get recognized, so stand up, single moms and single dads. Listen, thank you for what you do. I know what your life looks like behind the scenes. I know what it's like to be the sole Uber driver for your family and to have to cook all the meals. I know what it's like to be the um, sole the sole financial provider in your home. I know what it's like to carry the emotional and mental weight of your kids as they are healing from a divorce and grieving the loss of their family unit while you yourself are also grieving. So single parents, I just wanna say thank you for being that stability for your family. Thank you for showing up here. It's not always easy as a single parent to walk into church, but I know Freedom Church is so happy to have all of you here. And thank you, thank you, thank you, single parents. So another round of applause for those people. I thought first it would be great for me to introduce you to my family so you get to know me a little bit. These are my sons. I have three of them, and I just, they would really love how large they are on this screen um, because they are actually probably over six feet in comparison to real life where they're only about 5'11", but evidently that one inch makes a big difference when you're a boy. But these are my three sons, and one of the things that's unique about my family is all three of my sons are really big into football, and I love football, so it's actually a great fit for me to be their mom. My oldest son, Jet, right here on your right, he just finished his senior season at Birmingham Southern playing corner. My middle son, who actually prefers to be called the center child, so if any of you have a middle child, switch the terminology. They love being called the center child. He'll correct me. I'm the center child, mom. Okay, babe. Yep, you are. Um, he plays, hold on, he's not corner, he's safety. I was like, it's the other DB. He's safety at Rhodes College in Memphis. And then my youngest son, Brewer, is actually QB1 at our 6A school in Franklin, Tennessee. So all three of my kids play football. And I love, love, love that part of my life. In fact, I love it so much that I like to say I'm classy until kickoff. Any of you sports parents probably know what I mean. Anyone have ever sat at their kid's game and the whistle sounds and all of a sudden something takes over your body and you don't know what is happening and you don't know what's coming out of your, wor your mouth. There are words you don't typically say. You don't know how your body's responding because they are, they are actions you don't typically do. And then I usually wake up on Saturday morning and then Sunday morning after the college games and I have to spend my morning repenting from everything I did on that Saturday night and Friday night, even though I still believe the morning after that the ref was stupid and didn't know what he was doing when he made that call. But I end up having to repent from that. So if you're single, there is a good chance that you've tried dating. And plenty of people are gonna tell you how much fun dating is. Do you know what all of those people have in common? They're all married. You know who knew that? The single people. The single people knew that it's the married people who tell you how much fun dating is. I've done quite a bit of dating. I've taken a lot of approaches to dating and I've tried the apps. And if we had more time, I would go into some of those stories because they're quite entertaining. But I'd start with the story of the Hansy Italian because that was a night I didn't know that I was gonna get out of. And then I'd probably move on to the married dad because I did not expect that when we went to dinner that he was still married. Don't put your single in your profile when you're still married, okay? But dating actually is a little bit painful when you are a single mom dating with three teenage young adult sons. And all three of my kids, dating in general is suffering a little bit, and all three of my kids have handled 
dating a little differently. In fact, my youngest son, Brewer, when he was fifth or sixth grade, he introduced me to his friend, Sam, and Sam's dad. And he started by saying, this is my friend, Sam. His dad is also divorced. And I thought, oh, good. He has another friend from a divorced family. Then much to my shock, I realized that he told me that piece of info and then started twitching his head and winking his eye because he was trying to play matchmaker between me and Sam's dad. And then there was Gage, my middle son, when my center child. Um, when he was a freshman, eighth grade freshman in high school, he went on a rant adamantly telling me how absolutely weird it would be if I were to ever go out with one of his friend's dads, which I had already done, unbeknownst to him, twice. He still doesn't know, still keeping that under wraps. Then there's Jet, my oldest um, son, and he is the hardest one to navigate because he's so super protective. And I figured out pretty quickly when I started dating as a single mom that it was easier to be an 18-year-old girl coming home to her 45-year-old father than it is to be a 45-year-old mom coming home to her 18-year-old son. And there was one evening, a little after 10.30, I had gone on a dinner date and I came home to a dark house. And assuming my kids were being obedient, they'd gone to bed, they'd turned out the lights, they'd done what I asked them to do, I tiptoed in the house so that I wouldn't wake anyone up, only had the light of my flashlight and I'm tiptoeing through the kitchen and I turn the corner to go into the family room and I hear a male voice. And that voice says, you missed curfew. And my immediate response was, yes, sir. And then I realized I'm the adult. I don't have a curfew. Dating when you have sons feels like a season of suffering. But let me tell you about how I ended up single and dating again. 2016 was the year that my husband walked away from our marriage. And over the last two weekends, you at Freedom Church have been talking about how we are all made in the image of God. And you want to talk about something that can make you question the image of God in yourself. It's someone who is supposed to love you for who you are, rejecting you. 2016 was a doozy of a year, to say the least, a year I never, ever expected to experience. I'm going to give you just a quick glimpse of my life pre-divorce. I married my college sweetheart and very early into our marriage, we started two churches, the latter being Cross Point Church in Nashville, Tennessee. And the church boomed in growth and so did my pastor husband's career. In fact, the church spent numerous years listed as one of the fastest growing churches in the nation. And as the church grew, it expanded to five campuses across Middle Tennessee. And then in 2016, my husband announced that he was resigning from the church. His departure from the church and our family played out on the front pages of local, state, and national publications. The first paragraph of the news story in the Tennessean put it this way, Pastor Wilson, who founded Cross Point Church 14 years ago, said he resigned as pastor of the area megachurch because he is tired, broken, and in need of rest. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, I was dealing with some painfully private things that the readers of the Tennessean weren't privy to. The narrative being repeated was about an overworked pastor who was burned out, and the reality was I'd been sleeping alone, not by my own choosing, for more than six months. In my heart, I knew my suspicions were correct and the brokenness went much deeper. Trust had once again been broken in my marriage and I was experiencing another devastating heartbreak. The reality is I didn't just lose my marriage and family unit, I lost my church family. The people I had spent the last 14 years leading and loving, the staff I shared a meal with every week at staff meeting and regularly invited into my home, the ladies who I'd had babies alongside and raised our children together. The church just wasn't a job or a role for me, but a spiritual extended family that I loved and was honored to serve. One Sunday, I was one of, at one of our five campuses hugging people, and the next Sunday, I was hiding out in my house 
telling my kids that the dad didn't work at the church anymore. It wasn't just my marriage that unraveled. Life as I knew it ended. And I'm aware that my divorce played out a little more public than most divorces are, but I've talked to enough men and enough women to know that divorce always plays out in some public way for everyone. Even if it's just in your neighborhood, in your extended family, maybe it's on Facebook or under the steeple of your church. The unraveling of your family unit is traumatic and it can often feel like all eyes are on you. I was devastated, heartbroken. I was scared, hopeless, rejected, insecure, unequipped, full of fear, embarrassment, hurt, and the list could keep going. I was a leader who wasn't leading. I was a wife whose marriage was ending, a mom who was afraid that she couldn't provide. I had so many questions without answers, and I bet if I could sit down and talk to each of you, we could share moments in your life that felt unbearable and crushing and painful. It could be the story of your own divorce. It might be waiting for a medical diagnosis. Maybe you're grieving the death of a loved one. You're having a hard time with that grief. Maybe it's figuring out how to best meet the needs of your physically disabled child. Perhaps you're an empty nester wondering what to do now that your house is so quiet. Or maybe you chose to have a baby solo after your partner walked away. During these seasons of tragedy and trauma, the questions we ask ourselves are overwhelming. How did this happen? Why did he leave? When will the heartbreak end? Is this all there is to life? Am I gonna make it through this? Will I be okay? Will my kids be okay? The good news this morning is we can walk through those detrimental seasons of life and come out on the other side, not just okay, but better than okay. We can keep going when we're exhausted. We can lean into community even when we can't make sense of it. We can trust God with our heartbreak. These moments can become holy moments, a time when we partner with the Holy Spirit to see something that the enemy of our soul meant to break is actually useful and can be used and called holy. These holy moments allow us to see things from a different perspective. And it was in that season of my own life that I began to realize that an emotionally stronger me creates an emotionally stronger we. Our first bit of scripture this morning comes out of 1 Chronicles 28, 20. David said to Solomon, his son, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God is with you and he will not fail you or forsake you until the work of the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Now, that passage of scripture in Chronicles, David is giving his charge, his charge to all of Israel and to his son Solomon. He is reminding them to seek God and obey God and establishes that God has chosen Solomon for this project. And he charges Solomon to yield his heart and mind to God in all things and that God will be with him and won't leave him until he finishes building the temple. So let's take that a step further because in 1 Corinthians six nineteen, Paul tells us, Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? We're told our bodies are a temple and we embrace that in regards to our physical bodies. We embrace that in regards to our physical health. However, we end up rejecting and neglecting the importance of our emotional strength. There is work to be done in building our emotional strength. Strength. There is work to be done in the temple of our house for the Lord that we need to work on becoming emotionally stronger because God is very concerned about the health of our souls, which is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And our emotional strength, our ability to get back up again and keep going, it's something that God takes very seriously. It tells us in Matthew What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? A large portion of my personal journey over the last seven years has involved becoming emotionally stronger. 
About a year after my divorce, I sat down with my therapist and I remember telling her, I'm exhausted. I get plenty of sleep. I eat pretty healthy. I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do and still I feel totally depleted. And she responded with, you're in the process of building your emotional endurance. You have a great physical endurance. You accomplish a lot of things. You complete a lot of things. But your emotional strength and endurance is weak. And I did not like her answer. But that response, it, it spurred me to dig in and begin to really understand and develop my emotional strength and endurance. Because an emotionally stronger me creates an emotionally stronger we. And that we is in all of our relationships, the intimate ones like you have with your partner, the relationships you have with your children, your family members, the relationships we have with coworkers and friends, and most importantly, the relationship that you have with Jesus. Your emotional strength is essential to your faith, your relationships, and to living out your purpose and destiny. Emotional strength enables us to keep trying, keep believing, keep loving, keep getting back up again, no matter what life throws at us. I'm going to actually read out of my book um, a passage I've written about how I look at emotional strength. Uh, It's an illustration of the three areas that we need to lean into. I was raised in a teeny tiny town in Western Kentucky called Fredonia. Fredonia has about 400 residents, a single caution light, and one store, creatively named The Store. It's a very agricultural community, lots of manual labor, and most of the residents are blue collar. My dad worked over 40 years as a truck driver. He mostly drove local where he was home each evening before dinner. Every night he walked in and did the same routine. He kissed my mom, greeted my brother and I, and went to his bathroom to empty the contents of his pockets. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, that was his regular after work rhythm. While the shirt he was wearing as his unofficial truck driver uniform changed with the seasons, a colored t-shirt in the summer and a flannel button up in the winter, every work day he wore blue jeans. I watched him unload the pockets of his blue jeans hundreds of times. So many treasures were laid on that bathroom vanity each evening. The contents of his pockets were like a treasure map of his day, receipts from where he'd had lunch and stopped for snacks, the same pocket knife he'd carried for as long as he could remember, and a ticket from one of his drop-offs, and lots of change, you know, quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies. This was pre-debit card, so cash was king and used for every purchase, and Dad always came home from his workday with a pocket full of coins. The contents of his pockets were loosely divided into three areas. One, the things he threw in the trash, like gum wrappers and old receipts. The things he knew he would need the next day, his pocket knife and chapstick. And then third, the things he filed away for the future, the coins, Quarters, nickels, dimes, pennies. He would open the doors to his cabinet under his sink and divide the change by coin into buckets. So let's take that process and the things we carry with us each day in regards to our emotional strength and break it down. So the first thing that needs to happen to transform from a life that is okay to better than okay is you must throw out the trash. Better than okay means throwing out the trash. David instructed Solomon, do not be afraid or discouraged. Emotionally strong people are less discouraged by setbacks and disappointments. They throw out the trash of fear and discouragement. Emotionally strong people face discouragement. They just don't allow it to overcome them. They don't waste energy on things they can't control. You won't hear an emotionally strong person complaining relentlessly over lost luggage or a long line at the DMV. Instead, they focus on what they can control. And often they recognize the only thing they can control is their attitude. They understand that where their energy goes, their energy flows. They don't spend major time on minor things Emotional strength is not about turning a negative into a pleasurable experience. Bad things are going to happen. Bad things are inevitable. And when they happen, we need to be able to deal with them. 
One of the main reasons mentally strong people do not waste time feeling sorry for themselves is because they're aware that where the energy goes, the energy flows. And when we focus on everything that's going wrong in our life, our thoughts, they become exaggeratedly negative. And the negative thoughts will impact our behavior if they're dwelled upon. So when you respond to painful emotions with negative self-talk, research says you are actually training your brain to be ashamed of feeling bad. Emotionally strong people realize that it's actually much more helpful to be compassionate and understanding with yourself when you feel bad. In other words, they practice self-compassion. True emotional strength comes from gentleness, not criticism. Starting life over, I had to shift the way I talk to myself. Yes, I talk to myself. I'm betting you do too. I would tell myself things like, no one will ever love me, or my life has been destroyed. And I I stopped that and began telling myself, the best is yet to come. I'd tell myself, I am securely loved by my heavenly father. Telling myself the best is yet to come and reminding myself I was securely loved, it changed the outlook and it removed the trash that had been bouncing around in my head for far too long. Negative talk impacts your mental health. The Mayo Clinic tells us that turning negative self-talk into positive thinking can help reduce your risk of depression It can lower levels of distress and improve your coping skills. So I want you to take a second. What trash are you telling yourself that needs to be thrown out? What negative talk is bouncing around in your head and needs to be rewritten? Our negative feelings can be strong, but God is so much stronger. Take those to him. He cares deeply about your emotions. He listens when you pour out your heart. He doesn't get tired of us or feel like our problems are too small. He wants us to come to him. He wants to help you. The next thing emotionally strong people do is they know what they need. Being, uh, living a life better than okay means you know what you need. First off, we all have needs, and having needs does not make you needy. And I'll also add that knowing what you need also doesn't take away the fear of asking for it. Having needs doesn't make you needy. It makes you uniquely you. So understanding what I need has been a game changer in my emotional strength. I spent so much time thinking about what others need, like my kids and my friends, that I neglected understanding that about myself. And God actually created us with needs unique to our makeup. I need more time alone than most of my friends do. I need to be, to know that I've been heard. I need more time to process rather than responding on the spot. But this morning, I'm gonna zone in to one need that God gave all of us, the need for connection. Romans 12 says, we are better together than we are alone. And we all crave belonging and community. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We need true belonging. And the truth is, we need each other. We need to trust, rely, and depend on one another. God gave us each other to walk alongside, encourage, to spur one another on in love. We're able to carry each other's burdens, care for others' practical needs, and warn each other of sin. And the best part, we get to celebrate one another. We all have the need to connect with others, yet we spend more time protecting ourselves than being vulnerable. And research shows that actually using those protective strategies take more of your energy than vulnerability does. Might be hard to believe, but it's true. And when we function in protection mode, we miss that connection with other people. And I want to pause for a second, and I just want to say, I know a lot of you guys have been hurt in relationship, whether it's within your marriage, whether it's coworkers, someone you lead, you've experienced betrayal. 
We have all experienced some type of hurt in connection with another person that has caused us not to be vulnerable, not to lean in to community. We've isolated ourselves and isolated our hearts in order to avoid experiencing that pain again. And I understand why a lot of us choose to function in protection mode. We don't want our hearts to experience that level of pain or betrayal again. Dating actually brought back a fear to the front lines that I hadn't expected. And I asked myself, do I trust myself enough to survive the possibility of engaging with someone who could break my heart again? I didn't wanna ever experience that level of pain and hurt from another individual in my lifetime. That fear bounced around in my head more than I was willing to admit. The fear of experiencing that level of betrayal and suffering from someone that I loved. And during a conversation with a girlfriend where I had chosen to be vulnerable, I was sharing my fear and she shared just the wisest illustration that I'm gonna share with you guys this morning as you face your fears about engaging in community and learning to trust someone again. She compared the emotional and mental healing to a bulletproof vest. And she reminded me, when your husband left you, you were shattered. Your heart was broken and you were lost, but you made the decision to seek health, healing, and growth. And you've done a lot of hard work on yourself and how to be the healthiest and most confident version of you. Think of all of that hard work like it's a bulletproof vest. Chances are you could get hurt again but the work you've done will mean that you have been protected from it. It's not gonna be as bad this time around. And she was right. I'm not at all the same person I was seven years ago when my husband left. The work I've done has changed how I engage in relationship and how I show up for myself. It's why I encourage others to dig in and do healing work. Find a therapist. It's another reason I encourage you to take care of yourselves because all the work you do on you will impact your relationships. The emotionally stronger I am, the work I do in me is going to create a healthier we. And life is so much better when we do it in community. We accomplish more, we share the burdens, we share the celebrations, we need each other. We need each other for encouragement, for help, for support in all of the ways, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And then lastly, better than okay means filing for the future. One of my favorite um, parts of my dad's daily ritual was the change and sorting all of the coins that he'd bring home at the end of the day into the containers under his sink. Occasionally, I'd just walk into their bathroom and open the doors and look at all the bucket full of coins. It was like a treasure. And then every once in a while, while we were watching TV as a family at night, probably UK basketball, wasn't a good year for us. Um, He would pull out those buckets of change and he'd pull out these sleeves that he got from the bank and we would spend the evening wrapping those coins in sleeves. And I, I really never knew what happened to them. We just wrapped them and gave them back to dad. But those rolled sleeves of coin helped create my favorite Christmas memory when I was about 10 years old. My brother would have been about six at the time and we ran into the family room excited to see what was under the tree, the gifts that Santa had left us. And as we rummaged through the gifts, there was one big white box toward the back of the tree. And my brother and I, we grabbed that box and we started pulling it out together. And when my eyes finally focused, I screamed, It's a VCR, which I know ages me. But back in the mid 80s, VCRs, they weren't very common, especially in my tea tiny Southern town. VCRs were actually cutting edge technology and they were super expensive. But my dad had filed all of those coins for the future. He had saved that change to buy something special that wasn't in their regular budget. Even my mom was not aware of his VCR purchase. It was, he was intentional to use something from the past that he had saved when he needed it in the future. Living life means you will experience hurt, heartache, and pain. And let me take a second and say, I'm sorry for the pain you've experienced 
As someone who has also experienced immense pain, I know how hard it is to keep going. I know how much you wanna just take a nap and wake up to a happier situation. I know depression. I know the weight you carry. I know the overwhelming anxiety. I know that some days the sadness overcomes you. I know you have unanswered questions and you might be battling forgiveness. But I wanna encourage you this morning. I want you to process the pain that you're feeling and allow God to use that in your life. Because once pain enters your soul, it doesn't just leave, it changes and you grow around it. Your personal growth is your choice. You don't drift into emotional strength. It's an intention you choose as you move forward. And your personal growth is one of the few things you can control in life. Emotional strength or the ability to get back up again and keep going, it is not something we have to muster up. It's a byproduct of having a close relationship with God. He helps us believe in what we can't see. He promises to clear our record of guilt. He promises that we can face challenges or failures in our life with the resilience to start again. And when we walk with God, he gives us emotional strength. He helps us handle setbacks and disappointments without becoming easily discouraged. He strengthens us as we vulnerably express our needs and he helps us adapt to change. He teaches us through our mistakes and helps us handle the pain we experience. Emotionally strong people, they are able to allow their suffering to be a catalyst for personal growth. And they often use their suffering as a survival guide for others experiencing a similar pain. Emotionally strong people, they want to allow God to redeem their pain and use it for his greater purpose. We're gonna go back and and we're gonna hit on that temple being built that I talked about at the beginning of the message. The temple that Solomon commanded David to build, it was magnificent and it was breathtaking and it was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. But 400 years after the temple was completed, it ended up being completely destroyed. But the Israelites, they are a persistent bunch of people. They refused to allow that setback to derail them and they began to rebuild It took so many years, but they built it back. It took blood, sweat, and tears, but they built it back. It was hard, tedious work, but they built it back. Even when they wanted to give up, they kept working and they built it back. They wanted to throw in the towel, but they built it back. You know, it was interesting because they refused to be distracted. They continued to give it all they had and they built it back. And after all of that hard work, dedication and perseverance, there was a group of Jews who were disappointed that the rebuilt temple was not as grand as the first one. And Haggai responded to that in Haggai 2.9 and he prophesied, the future glory of this temple will be, will be, The future glory of this temple will be greater than the past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place, I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. I will bring peace. That prophecy came to pass because Jesus himself was physically in that rebuilt temple, bringing a greater glory to it. Throwing out the trash, knowing what you need, and filing for the future that's gonna make you emotionally stronger. And I want you to remember, you're not doing it alone. God is with you. When the days are hard, he's building you back. When you wanna give up, he's building you back. When you are discouraged, he's building you back. When you feel lost, he's building you back. When you're at rock bottom, he's building you back. When your heart hurts, he's building you back. And as you are building yourself back emotionally, he's right there with you. And he is building you back and promises that the future glory of your life will be greater. Last summer, I was sitting by a fire at the beach and 
scattered around the fire were fishing poles and some really nasty, gross fishing bait my kids were using. And um, there were a few snacks and some drinks and my three sons. And, and I had this moment. In fact, I actually snapped a selfie to be able to remember the moment, the completeness of my family that some would define as broken. Because the truth is, one of my biggest fears as a single mom was redefining our family. How do you move forward as a family and not feel like something is missing? When you've always envisioned your family unit with two parents, what does it look like to move forward and start over as a single parent? I have been a single mom now for eight years and my boys, they spend the large majority of their time at my home. And and I'm here to tell you that we have redefined family beautifully. Our individual lives and our family is definitely better than okay. A few things we do, we're intentional, we show up, we stay, we're truthful. Our family is safe, we trust one another, our home is full, we have conflict and we work it out. We have hard conversation, we love, we laugh, we make lots of milkshakes, we snap lots of photos, we cheer one another on, we fight over the bathroom, we work hard to allow each other to be their own individual and also part of this incredible family. Did I want divorce to be part of my story? No. Did I want divorce to be part of my kid's life? Absolutely not. But would I change where we are today? Not on your life. We are incredibly close and always available for one another. We are messy, we are beautiful, and we are family. We are definitely better than okay. Lord, thank you for this morning as we come together to talk about doing life with you in emotional strength. And I just wanna take a moment and ask, as people are sitting in those seats, if there is something that they need to throw out in their negative self-talk, Lord, that you will just allow them to remove that from their head, to remove speculation and imagination and allow their thoughts to be filled with you. Lord, the people who have a need that they're not speaking up and asking for that need to be met, just give them the courage to be able to ask for what they need with the person they're in relationship with and give them the strength to handle whatever the answer is from that person. And God, just help us to figure out what we need to keep for the future We are all experiencing some level of pain. And I just wanna ask, Lord, that you allow us to walk through that pain holding your hand, and then you guide us forward so that we can give pain greater purpose through you, God. In your name I pray this morning, amen. So now where do you need to respond? What is God saying to you today? And what are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do about your heartbreak, your pain? We have several options for you to help you respond. Some of you may be going through heartbreak right now. What if you allowed somebody to pray with you? We have a prayer team on both sides of the auditorium who are ready and want to pray with you and for you. Upstairs in the balcony and also on the floor, you see crosses on either side. I found that even in the midst of my heartbreak, there were pieces of my heart that needed to repent for my sin. The cross, the cross is there today so you can write down something you need to move away from and leave it where it belongs, at the feet of Jesus. We also have candles and communion. Candles are a symbol of light and I believe that there are some of you today that are going to be a healthier version of you in this darkness because the light of the world is gonna help break apart the darkness. Go and light a candle so you can remember this moment. And then we can all take communion together, remembering the body and the blood that was broken and spilled for us. So let's worship as we respond.